taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Those words from the psalmist today help to encapsulate and encapsulize and really show us what the life of faith is about. To taste and see the goodness of the Lord. I don't know about you, but when I heard for the first time and really read our first reading today from the book of Kings, I kind of empathized with Elijah a little bit. He had just taken a walk in the desert for a day. I did that last Sunday in Vegas. It was hot. And I got under a tree called the Palms Hotel, but still a tree. And I got under there and thought, Lord, I'm ready. Take me now. As Elijah thought in today's first reading, he thought that his journey had ended. He was done. He was overwhelmed. How many times have we had those same or similar thoughts in our own lives? Lord, this is too much. Lord, my cup runneth over. Lord, I can't take any more. Just take me now. And the Lord's like, there, there. Bless your heart. I'm not done with you yet. So he sends an angel and says, here, eat, drink. Elijah's like, but I don't, fine. Like our kids are sometimes, we're like, but I don't want to have pancakes. I want bacon. I want bacon too, but sometimes you have to have pancakes. And so God gives this food to Elijah under the tree. And so what does he do? He eats, and then he's like, okay, now, Lord, I'm ready. I'm done. So he falls asleep again or tries to. And the Lord says, <laughs> bless your heart. I'm not done with you yet. And sends an angel and says, eat and drink. You need to be nourished for the journey that you're about to go on. The journey I'm about to go on, I just got done with my journey. No, you're not done yet. <sighs> but what does God do? He gives him everything that he needs for his journey. Gives him food, gives him water to be nourished. And it's interesting that the same things that we need to be nourished in our everyday lives are the same ways that God nourishes us in the faith. We're in the midst of the gospel of the bread of life discourse. If you've noticed the last few weeks, we haven't been reading from the gospel of Mark. We've been reading the last three weeks and the next two weeks from the gospel of John chapter 6, known as bread of life discourse. And in this is where we hear the centrality of the faith as Catholics. That Christ is the sacrificial lamb. That unless you eat this bread and drink my blood, you have no life within you. That he is the bread of life. What's interesting is, at the end of today's gospel, Jesus said, My flesh is the life of the world. Now, for the people that were hearing this, they would have been taken aback. Because to eat flesh and to drink blood were forbidden in that time. In fact, when you have the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb, which all of the good Jews would have known, even if they were just practicing Jews or cultural Jews, they would have known that you were forbidden from drinking the blood of any living animal. And that you were also not to eat its flesh. But what does Jesus do? He comes and turns the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb of Passover on its head and says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. So Christ gives of himself in a way that we weren't supposed to receive before. He's changing the message and saying, I give you every piece of me. Not that you may eat and die as your ancestors did when they ate manna in the desert, that manna that is believed to be the bread of the angels, the food of the angels, as many scholars would call it. But that didn't sustain them until the next day when they had to do it again for breakfast and then quail at night. But the bread that I am going to give is my flesh for the life of the world. So it's no coincidence then, the last time that we receive communion on this side of the veil... It's called viaticum. Have you ever heard that word before? It's Latin. Viaticum, a communion for the way. The bread to pave the price for our sins. The bread to lead us into heaven, to nourish us for that journey that we are on. But that's the last time that we receive communion. 
Every other time that we receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist, whether in the species of the host or in the chalice, we are also being nourished to go and proclaim God's word, to go and do the work that he has for us here in life. That bread, that food, nourishes us and sustains us. But we don't need just food to sustain us. What else do we need? What are our bodies primarily made up of? Water. Baptism. See how I did there? Perfect. With baptism, our place in heaven is being prepared for us. Our sins are being washed from us, that we die with our sins, that we may rise with Christ. That's what we're here to celebrate in a very special way for Cal today. This opportunity for him to have the ability to rise to newness of life. That opportunity that each and every one of us was given at our baptism, but as an opportunity, it must be claimed and lived. I can give you a million dollars, but if you don't use it or utilize it, it's worthless. Our baptisms, however, are never worthless. They give us more than we can ever deserve and more than we can ever understand. That with our baptism, that gateway opens for us. With nourishment throughout our lives of faith, with catechesis, with the Eucharist, we are being given what we need to make it in that tough world out there. Because the world doesn't want us to be good, ironically. The world wants us to be of the world and not just in it, but as Christians, as Catholics, we are called to be in it and not of it, which means we are called to be members of the world, but our membership is in heaven, which means if we are living life just like everybody else, we may not be walking the straight and narrow. It's a challenge for all of us. That if we don't seem odd in our community, that may not be a good thing, ironically. Because we all want to fit in in the world, right? We all want to feel like we aren't that outcast. But to be a Christian is to be countercultural. That if everything out there seems right, we need to check ourselves. And really ask ourselves, are we doing what the Lord is calling us to do? Or are we doing what the world is telling us is right? As that old saying goes, what is popular isn't always right, and what is right isn't always popular. With our baptisms, we are given that gift of faith. We are marked with the sign of the Holy Spirit, and that indelible mark, not like indelible markers that, are, that don't come out until you wash them hard enough, But that indelible mark that is put on our souls through the sacrament of baptism, no matter how much rubbing you do, it's still there. That's why it always kind of confounds me when I hear people say, well, I grew up as a Christian, but I'm not anymore. You're baptized. You're stuck with us. That's a good thing, that we are stuck because of our baptisms. Because it's not really being stuck. It's really being given that opportunity to allow the Lord to unstick us from our sins. Because sin is grimy. Sin really mucks up our lives, makes it really, really difficult for us to embrace God's love, difficult for us to see the grace and the mercy and the peace that he wants for us in our lives. That's why, as I said a couple weeks ago when we had a baptism during Mass, I prefer to have them during Mass than outside of Mass to remind me, to remind all of us that we are all called as members of the body of Christ to help raise these children of faith. I love hearing a child cry at Mass. The parents are like, oh, Father, don't say that. My kids drive me crazy during Mass, and I know everybody around me, they just look at me during Mass. I look and say, oh, that's so cute. And then I start to throw up. It's like, ah. That's when it's nice to be a funkel, a fun uncle, or a priest, because you could be like, hey, here's a drum set. Peace out, I'm a gone. (laughs) As every fun uncle should do for their nieces and nephews. Don't do that. You didn't hear that from me. 
But it's beautiful to see the faith of our young people. And it only exists because of you parents bringing them and you grandparents bringing them that they shouldn't be a thorn in our side, but they should be that hope that brings peace to our hearts. A church that has no children is a church that is dying. It's one of my favorite parts of Mass, as strange as this may sound, is the children's collection. If you've ever watched it on the live stream after the fact, it looks like I'm about to be mauled. So I'm standing up here, hey guys, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. But it's so beautiful. Because we see that the faith is alive here at St. Matthew's. We see that the faith is present in our young people. That's why catechesis is so important for them. But not just for them, but for us as well. How many of us, and you don't have to raise your hands because I know the answer, how many of you have not been to a class of catechesis since you were confirmed? Don't raise your hands. I'm assuming the majority, just nodding. That's why we have an opportunity this year to have catechesis for our adults. Because you don't graduate from the faith. One of the reasons that, that the Diocese of Oklahoma City is changing confirmation is because confirmation is not graduation from the faith. It's the completion of the sacraments of initiation that begin at baptism. But many times we treat confirmation as graduation. We even put them in robes and try and understand why they are looking at it as their freedom from faith. Ironically, the only thing that will actually keep you free is your faith. But we don't have much catechesis for young adults, for young families. For mothers and fathers, there's not a book out there. Did anybody find a book when you had your first kid? Anybody? It's because it's not existent. Because every couple is different and every family is different. That they all have to, in their own beautiful, special, unique way, embrace and share the faith with each other and then with their progeny, their children, later on. But if all we're doing is dropping our kids off at catechesis and not ourselves being filled, we're giving the wrong message. And the promises that mom, dad, and godparents just made was that cow will be brought up in the faith. But they can't be the only catechists. So we're calling on those members of the community of faith to step up to help each other learn the faith. But that means we have to learn it first. There's that old philosophical ideal, you can't give what you don't have. If I don't understand the faith, I can't properly teach it. If I don't have a million dollars, I can't give a million dollars. Well, why not? Because it's just impossible. So if I don't understand the faith, if I don't have a personal relationship with Christ, it's hard for me to talk about how for you to have a personal relationship with Christ. And so we as members of the body of Christ are called to never stop learning, to never stop growing. That unlike when we go to school and you graduate and you're done, you're never really done. That continuing education you have at your work, they just tricked you when you graduated high school and college. You're done learning until safe environment comes along and there's more reading and more tests, until there's more continuing education and whatever else there is. But we're willing to take those lessons on, but when it comes to the faith for some reason, and eh, the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit, that's enough for me. No. We have to continue to grow and deepen our understanding, our faith, our tradition, or we will lose it. Why have we lost so many generations of the faithful? Because we as a church, I'm including myself as a priest in that, have not done good enough showing what a life of faith is about. And it means embracing our baptism, embracing the cross, embracing our countercultural sacrifice. Sacrifice, that four letter word, giving up. It's not just for Lent. <laughs> for every moment of our lives? How do we change and allow the Lord to change us? Well, it starts with step one. 
It starts with hearing those words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It starts with your parents, depending on your age, making that ascent of faith for you. Yes, I understand the responsibility of raising my child in the faith, so much so that my godparents that I've chosen for my child, when I fail, they're there to help pick up the picture and pick up the pieces. So we can all be in this struggle together as a community of faith and as a family of faith. So as we continue through this Mass and celebrate Cal's baptism, may we remind ourselves of our own. May we truly see the goodness of the Lord in the baptismal font and in this new sacrament of initiation, but also may we taste the goodness of the Lord as we receive him body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Then we truly can, as we profess together in our psalm, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. But it's not just for today. It's for every moment of every day until he calls us home and we can truly see the goodness of the Lord.